Good evening and welcome. My name is Scott Smith and I am one of the organizers of this year's Saul O. Sador Memorial Lecture Series. And I'm extremely pleased to see, to see such a large crowd tonight on this evening, which I might call the Lonely Hearts for the Arts Night rather than Valentine's Day. Before we turn to tonight's speaker, I'd like to thank a number of people who have made this event possible. First, I would like to acknowledge my uh, fellow organizers, and uh, if you'll please like, raise your hand for recognition when I call your name. So Sarah Wolper, over there. Nicole Ruain, Greg McMahon, uh, as well as uh, those who have worked behind the scenes to make everything possible as well, including um, the director for the Center for the Humanities, Bert Feintuck, in the front row, who should waste his hand as well. Um, as well as the Saul O. Sador Memorial Foundation, which has provided the financial support for this and other slate of speakers uh, for the series. Also, this event would have collapsed in a heap of rubble without the impressive work of our administrative departmental manager, Jennifer McCready, who is really the engine uh, under the hood. So can we thank her and all the rest for those of, uh, who have contributed to this evening? Thank you. Finally, I would like to thank all of the honor students who are here taking part in our symposium. So can you all raise your hand, all the, all the fine students for taking part of the symposium, entitled, Who Owns the Past? We hope that you're being inspired to ask and debate the big questions about cultural heritage and the preservation of the past. And of course, we greatly appreciate all of you putting your romantic lives on hold for just a few hours while we turn our attention to some important and urgent questions. For example, in our increasingly presentist world with the unchecked rush for progress, does the past even matter? And if we decide it does, how do we protect it? And who has a responsibility for doing so? In short, as we ask in our series title, who, in fact, owns the past. Our series was inspired in great part by an important and controversial book by our speaker entitled Who Owns Antiquity, Museums, and the Battle Over Our Cultural Heritage, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2008. When I say controversial, I mean anything having to do with art, art history, and preservation is, is by definition controversial. This book makes an argument that the Universal Museum, especially in the age of increasing uh, nationalism, has a central role in protecting and pre pre presenting our cultural heritage. His passionate cri de cour is, of course, based on his many positions as museum director. After receiving his PhD from Harvard and a gig as assistant professor at Vassar College, he served as, and the list is long, director of the Grunwald Center for the Graphic Arts in UCLA, director of the Hood Museum, of art at Dartmouth College, the Elizabeth and John Morris Cabot Director of the Harvard University Art Museums and Professor of the History of Art and Architecture, Director and Professor at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London, and President and Eloise W. Martin Director of the Art Institute in Chicago. All of this, of course, preceded his apotheosis to his current position in 2011. In addition to his book, Who Owns Antiquity, our speaker is author and editor of three other books on museums and the preservation of cultural heritage. But it would, I would also like to point out to you, uh, in particular the students in the room, of his blog at the Getty Museum called The Iris, which is sub subtitled, uh, the most recent one subtitled, Behind the Scenes at the Getty. And I encourage all of you to go subscribe today. His most recent blog post highlights a new set of papers on the topic he's gonna talk about tonight, entitled, Our Responsibility to, to Protect Cultural Heritage uh, in Conflict Zones. Tonight's talk similarly moves away from museums into the conflict zones that threaten the survival of our cultural heritage. And so we are incredibly and exceptionally delighted that we have with us here tonight, Professor James Kuno, the president and CEO of the J. Paul Getty Trust, who will deliver our first spring Sador lecture, Cultural Heritage in Conflict Zones, Protecting the Past for the Future. Please help me welcome Professor James Kuno. Okay, thank you, Scott, and thank you all so much for coming out uh, tonight uh, on this auspicious evening, which is, as mentioned already, and I, as I only learned later this morning when I was reminded by my family that it was Valentine's Day. 
Uh, it's great to be back in New England. You know, it's a place where we've lived as a family for more than 20 years and where we still have a house I think of as across the river, uh, that is across the Connecticut River, so it's in Vermont. Uh, we get here, of course, this, over the summer. Our kids come up from Brooklyn with their kids, and so it's nice to be, it's nice to be back, nice to be back among all of you. Um, I want to start out with this um, uh, talk by showing you a brief um, video. The video is about three minutes, so it's, it is quite brief. But it kind of sets the stage for the, for the talk itself, so bear with me, please. Let's see if we can get that going. I just thought that was a kind of dramatic, if sobering, uh, introduction to the talk and what it means for us uh, as we face the extinction of so much cultural heritage on, on our watch, which is to say that this was done by something called the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. I'll get back to that at the end of my talk because that had a different set of circumstances for its organization and its creation back in the first years of the 21st century, 15 years ago or so. Um, but which has set a set of international norm of standard uh, of obligation to protection of, of hu human uh, human beings, but uh, which we're trying to build an application then to uh, that of cultural heritage. Um, but it strikes me is that you saw there the dramatic um, consequences of neglect of pr this responsibility to protect these things. We'll get into why one might want to protect cultural heritage at all. But nevertheless, just think about these things that are thousands of years old, that, it was un that withstood the tumult of time over the course of those thousands of years. And in our lifetime, in one instant, they're gone. They're gone forever. While you can restore and, re and rebuild and... and um, preserve to this some extent the materials of which they were made, you can't restore the integrity with which they were made. And that loss is a tremendous responsibility that we have to face, that our neglecting to protect these things is to condemn them to destruction. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into this and, and uh, you know, forgive me if it's a little sober at times, I'll try to bring it to life in the best way I can. Uh, but it's a great pleasure to have you coming out on this night, uh, this wintry night in New Hampshire. Okay, is that up there? All right, yeah. So Palmyra, an image of which you see on the screen uh, before you, was one of the great cities of antiquity, comparable only to uh, Petra in Jordan, on the, far, on the left, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, and the Athenian Acropolis in Greece. It was known at the time as Tadmur, a city of that name appears in the Bible in the Second Chronicle, identified as the foundation of King Solomon, and it covered more than an area of more than 10, 10 square uh, kilometers. And it was a gateway to the west and to the east with traders from as far away as China applying their, their wares there in this o oasis town on this, along the Silk Road. So you can see the Palmyra with the red circle there, and you can see its extraordinary location uh, along the Silk Road, connecting everything as far as China to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the reason it was so uh, important in this regard was because, of course, it brought these, these cultures into, in, into contact with each other, and it transmitted the artistic qualities of different cultures across the Silk Road. Um, but it was because it was an oasis, oasis town. So it was a place in which, after long, dry days and weeks and months of 
traveling along the Silk Road, you came across greenery, you came across water, you came across ways to sort of restore yourself as you go forward, and where West met, literally met East. Uh, it was uh, traders from as far away as China plied their ware there, and Palmyrene traders, oops, you can see them on the left, figured on the left, um, called Merchants of the Sands, as they were called, established commercial colonies along the Silk Road. And during the Roma era, they developed a commercial culture. They built temples and structures there. You can see this oasis on the right-hand side. Have you, have you ever been to an oasis? Anyone been to one? I went to one just recently in, in, in Abu Dhabi, or outside of Abu Dhabi, called El Ain. And, uh, you know, some of us think of it as an oasis as just a place where there was a gathering of water, a pool of water, a natural source of water, the, the camels and, and the, the riders of camels could restore themselves as they, go, as they cross this, this um, dry desert. But of course, it's much more than that. It becomes a place that has to be cultivated and it has to be sort of protected and has to be expanded and, has to, and that requires a residential community of people and that becomes the beginnings of a town, becomes, it changes the course of culture and civilization as a result of that. So this the sense that it's there is, and it can be cultivated and protected means that one is developing a whole different understanding of human habitation as opposed to just being constantly on the move. One had to then remain in that era. So it was there these, uh, these um, uh, established these commercial colonies along the Silk Road and during, during the Roman era they developed a commercial culture that built temples, civic buildings, and tombs, and, and which they decorated with portrait busts like this one of the greatest beauty. Among the thousands of inscriptions carved, uh, in, carved into the city's buildings are dedications to gods and goddesses from the Phoenician, Babylonian, Arab, and Canaanite traditions. An early inscription dated AD 19 records contribution of a local worthy to the construction of the Temple of Bel. With the fall of the Roman Empire, Palmyra began to decline, however. Hundreds of years later, this once substantial oasis trading city was little more than a small village in the courtyard of an ancient temple, as you can see in this late 19th century photog photograph. The rise and fall of the Byzantine Empire, the Umayyad Caliphate, and the Ottoman Empire left their marks on this one great world trading center, as did the recent decades of the French Mandate after the First World War, the political and economic disruption of the Second World War, and six years of violent and tragic civil war. In 2004, and here you get a sense of how this ancient city was on the edge of this green belt of an oasis, how extensive that oasis was. You know, we think of it, as I said before, as a well under a palm tree, but there was an extensive uh, um, uh, oasis there. And in 2004, the latest year for which I could find reasonable or reliable numbers, Palmyra's population stood at 51,323 people. After six years of violent and tra tragic civil war, Palmyra's population now st stands at less than 2,000 people, with many of the ancient city's most important structures destroyed, some of which you just saw on that little video. The Temple of Bel, for example, the Temple of Balshamin, and later a Trapalon, tra tra as you can see there on the left and on the right, uh, and part of a Roman theater. It was also in Palmyra in August 2015 that the jihadist group known as ISIS took hostage Khalid al-Assad, the 81-year-old archaeologist who looked after the ancient remains of Palmyra. They killed him for not revealing where important antiquities were stored for safekeeping, and they hung his decapitated corpse from a column in the center of the ancient city. This evening, I will explore the circumstances that have reduced so much of the cultural heritage in Syria to rubble like the ancient remains of Palmyra on the left and those of the Umayyad Great Mosque of Aleppo on the right, including the advent and complexity of the Syrian civil war and the rise and character of the jihadist group ISIS. I will ask what role cultural heritage plays in the lives of the people who live with it daily as part of their religious practices, cultural identity, economic vitality, and as evidence of the long history and cultural diversity of the world of which they are a part, and why it is in the, in the world's interest to join together in the protection of cultural heritage. And I will propose a new legal norm or framework for the protection of cultural heritage in conflict zones. In the process, I hope to make it clear that we all have a stake in the preservation of the world's cultural heritage as our common heritage, 
that any and all forms of cultural expression produced at any time in, the, in any part of the world are all of ours to identify with and to be inspired by, by dint of our being capable of surmounting the limitations of our national affiliations, and that the more we understand this, the better off we will be, and the greater will be the prospects of a safer world. So I begin with the Syrian civil war, because this is just one example of one part of the world in which this loss of cultural heritage is taking place on a daily basis. In 1961, the Syrian Arab Republic was formed by coup d'etat. Two years later, following a military coup under the auspices of the Ba'ath Party, and for the next 48 years, it fell under emergency law still is under emergency law. In 1970, a military coup installed Hafez al-Assad as Syria's strongman president. 30 years later, he was succeeded by his son, Bashar al-Assad, who won 99.7% of the votes cast in the first, uh, his first uncontested election. And seven years later, he won 97.6 votes uh, of the votes cast in a second uncontested election. Bashar al-Assad remains president of Syria today. In 2011, in the wake of the Arab Spring, hundreds of thousands of Syrians took to the streets of the southern city of Dara to protest the punitive actions of Bashar al-Assad's government. By June 2013, the UN reported 90,000 people killed, more than 5 million people having fled the country, and more than 6 million people displaced internally. Today, approximately 70% 70, 70 of the Syrian population is without access to adequate drinking water, one in, one in three people are, are unable to meet their basic food needs, more than two million children are out of school, and four out of five people live in poverty. This is what years of civil war look like, as members of the anti-regime Syrian Democratic Force greet one another on the outskirts of the Syrian town of Raqqa after returning from the front line in the fighting against ISIS. And as the heart of the city looks today, the city of Raqqa, a crumbling mass of destroyed buildings slowly being re-inhabited by Syrians who had been driven from the city by the fighting of the Civil War. Only one elementary school is now operating in Raqqa today. The Syrian Civil War involves four overlapping conflicts. I mean, civil War is complicated. We think of it as you know, people in gray uniforms fighting people in blue uniforms. It's much more complicated than that, and that makes the whole consequence of the war so much more com com complicated to determine. The core conflict in the civil war is between forces loyal to President Assad and his government and the Syrian rebels who oppose him, an internal war, as one would expect. A second uh, core conflict involves foreign interventions with the United States, Turkey, and Arab states like Saudi Arabia, but also Jordan, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates opposing the regime of, of Assad. And those, Iran, Russia, and the Lebanese military group Hezbollah, who support it. A third conflict includes uh, Kurdish military fighters as part of the anti-regime Syrian Democratic Force fighting ISIS. The Kurds are a stateless ethnic group with a population of between 25 and 35 million people inhabiting a continuous mountainous land area spanning parts of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. And as I write, or as I speak, but as I wrote, they are part of a controversial American-trained force being positioned along Turkey's southern border to prevent a resurgence of ISIS there. They've been our closest ally in the fight against ISIS, the Kurds of uh, the northern part of, uh, of Syria. And they're being positioned along Kurdish, uh, Turkey's southern border to prevent a resurgence of ISIS there. Turkey, however, a native ally of the US, has long viewed the Kurds as a separatist terrorist group linked to a deadly insurgency threatened to it, threatening its territorial sovereignty. So a few weeks ago, the Turkish foreign minister uh, in ministry issued a statement critical of the American-led Kurdish campaign along its border, saying that Turkey, as a member of the coalition, this is where it gets complicated, Turkey's one of our allies and a NATO ally, member of the co coalition of which we're a part, and with the U.S. is opposed to the Syrian regime, was not consulted with regard to the establishment of the so-called Syrian border security force. The Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, was blunt threatening to, to, to destroy, in his words, the terror nests of the Kurdish forces. Then on January 19th, Turkish artillery fired shells into the northern region of Afrin, up in Syria, all near to the border with Turkey, prompting a response by the United States government calling on the Turks not to take action of any sort except against ISIS. The focus needs to be on ISIS, the State Department official said, so we don't want them, the Turks, to engage in violence, but to keep focused on ISIS. So you've got these different 
fights going on, and you've got different allies fighting these fights, contradicting themselves at times, depending on who, who one's fighting at any particular time. So keeping track of it, of what is the Civil War, is among the most difficult things of this campaign. This dispute along that border with Turkey and, and, uh, and Syria is yet more complicated, however, as the United States is an important supplier of arms and military aid to Turkey and has used Turkey's Enkrilik air base as part of its campaign against ISIS in neighboring Syria. In addition, since 2016, Turkey has improved relations with Russia and, and with Iran, two major fo foes, opposites, of the United States, while the largely autonomous Kurdish region in Iraq has developed close economic ties to Turkey and is, and is skeptical of the Syrian Kurds. So who's fighting whom at any given day and for what reason is a very complicated thing to keep track of. More recently, in rebel-controlled Idlib province in, in northern Syria, a Russian fighter jet was shot down by a ground-to-air missile and its pilot captured and killed by members of a militia on the ground in an area controlled by the Organization for the Liberation of Syria, previously known as the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Al-Nusra Front. In December, Pre Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered the withdrawal of Russian troops from Syria and declared the mission completed. Today, however, Russian authorities, together with Turkish forces responsible for the de-escalation zone, are working to retrieve the pilot's body. ISIS is at the center of the fourth conflict of the Syrian war and overlaps in each one of the other three. ISIS is a transnational jihadist group whose central tenet is the urgent need to defend the worldwide Muslim community from both foreign occupiers and domestic infidels and non-believers. It originated in 1999 as a Sunni insurgency force, not a, not a Shia, but a Sunni uh, insurgency, insurgency force, allied with a Jordanian radical group called Monotheism and Jihad. That gets to some of the underlying belief system of, of, the, of ISIS, it's a monotheism and the Jihad. Um, in 2004, it swore loyalty to Osama bin Laden and changed its name to the Organization of Jihad's base in Mesopotamia, commonly called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI. Then in January 2006, AQI joined with others to form the Mujahideen Shura Council, which nine months later changed its name to the Islamic State of Iraq, and then with the outbreak of the civil war in Syria in 2011, to the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. In 2014, ISIS the most extreme of the some 1,500 increasingly religious rebel groups by then operating in Syria, declared itself a caliphate, that is, a borderless theocratic polity, with Abu uh, Bakr al-Baghdadi as its leader, uh, its leader and caliph. At its, at its height, ISIS was the most powerful and effective jihadist group in the world, controlling an area larger than Great Britain, inhabited by some six million uh, people with 11 affiliates from Nigeria and Algeria to the west, to Pakistan and Russia in the east. With the fall of ISIS in its so-called capital of Iraq, and once again I show you Syrian forces following their victory over ISIS in Iraq, and its second largest city, Mosul in Iraq, ISIS holds a fraction of the area it once held but most analysts believe it has already morphed into an underground insurgency, both in Iraq and Syria, but also in the United States and Europe, as foreigners who join the group return home to carry out their terrorist agenda. So ISIS may have lost the battle, territorial battle of a caliphate, uh, but it has not lost its agenda and ambition to impose monotheism on, on the world, and has resurfaced not only in the areas I've described, but also increasingly, we understand, in, pa in Pakistan and in um, Afghanistan. So this is a recent map of Syria on the left uh, after seven years of civil war. The green space on the right is Iraq, rather much more coherent than that of Syria on the left. Over the years, maps of Syria have come to resemble jigsaw puzzles, which, as one journalist has written, change size and shape every time one tries to assemble the pieces. Syria is a fragmented, splintered, failing state, crisscrossed with roads of numerous militia groups and a jihadist insurgency calling itself a caliphate and a proxy for differences between Turkey and the Kurds, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and the U.S. and Russia. As with other failing states, Syria contributes to numerous transnational threats of terrorism, illegal trafficking, infectious disease, regional instability, and uncontrolled flow of refugees. Uh, you know, try, just trying to, as I've said many times, so forgive me for repeating myself, but you, you just got to get this into your head. It is the most complicated thing to, and, uh, to keep track of, and it's always in motion 
And, and, and uh, so even if it's complicated when it's mapped on a, on a map, tomorrow or the next day the alliance has changed depending on what the opportunities are that arise. Civil wars, as I've said, are stubborn and complicated things. Two recent volumes of Daedalus, which is the house journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, includes no fewer than 39 articles exploring various aspects of only the most recent and current civil wars, like the one in Syria. In one article, Stuart Patrick of the Council on Foreign Relations noted that Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense under both Presidents Bush and Obama, stated in 2010 that dealing with fractured or failing states is the main security challenge of our time and that President Obama in his final State of the Union address said that the U.S. was endangered less by evil empires and more by failing states. By definition, states engaged in civil war are failing states, and states like Syria with multiple arm armed opposition forces and various shifting alliances are fractured failing states. Patrick warns that uh, as the world has become interconnected in unprecedented ways, uh, the likelihood of any or all of the internal threats that I've described of failing states having to do with disease, having to do with human tra trafficking, having to do with uh, uh, failed uh, identified groups. Um, the internal threats in one country extend the opportunity of, 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 have the opportunity of extending beyond their borders of a single state uh, to other states to increasing the in, in kind of infection of a region uh, and, um, and the single state at war with itself. The question is how to respond to these threats. Almost always the response includes intervention by other countries. And as Patrick argues, the most powerful argument for intervening in, in internal conflicts is moral and humanitarian. Um, which is just to get a sense of that, that one, one doesn't intervene because one wants to take control of a situation, one has, wants to dominate a situation, but one wants to, it's the only way, means by which one can extend the kind of humanitarian gesture that, that uh, comes with a peaceful resolution of a, of a complicated setting. The greatest threat posed by internal violence, Patrick says, is our common humanity. Failed and war-torn states are the world's greatest generators of human misery. Tom Weiss, professor of political science at the CUNY Graduate School in New York City, has written a highly influential book on human humanitarian intervention, in which he reminds us that humanitarian intervention is coercive action. Quoting Adam Roberts, who wrote that by one or more states involved, involving the use of armed force in another state without the consent of its authorities and with the purpose of preventing widespread suffering or death among the inhabitants is by nature an intervening power. The scale of that suffering is important. Weiss also uh, was a principal author on the research materials that underpinned the report of the International Commission on Intervention in, uh, and State in 2001, and reminds us that in that case, following the Rwandan genocide, the bar for co coercive intervention was set high. He said, the threat or actual occurrence of large-scale loss of lice, life, especially genocide and mass um, forced migration, was the basis of, that was where the bar was set to justify intervention. If you could, by intervening, um, save uh, mass, uh, reduce large scale loss of life, especially through genocide and mass form force, forced migration, it was legitimate uh, activity. That is, the, the intervention was. Four years later, the intergovernmental resolution by the UN General Assembly at the September 2005 World Summit was more specific, reflecting restricting intervention, or the justification for intervention, to instances of genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. I will get back to this at the end of my talk, but let me emphasize here that in my view, the more than 450,000 Syrians killed, the more than 5 million Syrians forced to flee the country, the more than 6 million people displaced internally, the 70% of the population without access to adequate drinking water, the more the one in three people unable to meet their basic food needs, the more than two million children uh, out of school, and the four out of five people living in poverty, not to mention the evidence that nerve gas has been used against the civil civilian population, justifies intervention in Syria at even the highest of bars, but more on this later. I want now to raise the question, with so much human tra uh, tragedy in conflict zones, why should we even care about damage to or destruction of cultural heritage? I show you recent images of rebel forces in the heavily damaged uh, Great Umayyad Mosque of Aleppo. There, that's there. So they're in the midst of the this much destroyed monument, uh, and that's the basis of their military activity. Uh, one reason 
uh, with that we should be concerned, I think, is that the people affected by civil war and, and jihadist violence themselves care about the loss of cultural heritage. Last July, Mustafa Kurdi, supervisor of the reconstruction of the great Mahayad, uh, Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo, some aspects of what you see on the screen, um, said in the midst of ongoing military and social instability, and this shows you how it once was on the left, and then closer images of the destruction of it on the, on the right. He said, we are preparing now to bring the equipment to move the stones of the minaret and put them together and start to build as close as possible uh, as the original minaret was. Maybe some of the stones cannot be used again because they are broken. We shall have to find new stones from perhaps other older stones. If need be, we can make new stones look like old stones. This is a vast task, but we must consider our main work is rebuilding the minaret. I mean, these people care about it. We're not imposing upon them this concern for cultural heritage because we like it, because we, it touches something in us. This is something defining of them and who they think they, they are as, an, as, a, as a people. Uh, uh, other, other responses are more emotional than that. It is though we lost a close relative, Hyman Rifai, a 60-year-old Aleppo resident said, each time we come here, it feels worse. And Mohammed Marsi, standing with his son, shook his head and sighed, the destruction for the whole country is indescribable, just like what happened to the mosque. If you know the mosque before the damage, or knew the mosque before the damage and saw it now, it's like someone who, who lost a child or part of his body. And similar remarks have been made regarding the affected monuments in Palmyra. So one reason to be concerned about it, because people on the ground suffering in the midst of civil war themselves care about it. The journalist Hugh Aiken has written of the com commitment of local people to the protection, defense, and restoration of cultural heritage that they identify as theirs as being important to their com communal identity and as of value to their local economy. I mean, you have to ask, what are these people going to come home to? And one of the things they could come home to is something about which they gather around to define themselves as a community of people, about caring about themselves and each other in the form of these cultural heritage. Also, it can be the starter of a rejuvenated econ local economy. But, but Hugh Aiken says, Western leaders and cultural officials have overlooked the grave damage that is occurring in many other parts of Syria, other than Palmyra, he means, often in areas where preventative steps can be taken. And for all the extraordinary expressions of concern for the fate of the country's museums, monuments, and artwork, hardly anything has been said about the relation of these sites to the, to the communities surrounding them, which are often deeply attached to them. And this is a double tragedy, for not only have residents of the communities in question long been shown to be the first and most important line of defense in protecting sites and museums in times of conflict. In the case of Syria, many of these local preservationists have also been and continue to be in, a serious, in serious dangers themselves. Uh, apart from both from extremist groups and from the regime. So they're putting themselves at risk by caring so much about it. The power and authority of cultural heritage lies in its integrity as evidence of the continuing inspiring genius of humanity and as a source of local communal identity, economic recovery, and as an instrument of civil society. These two things are intertwined. That is what we see in them from afar as of having great beauty and the function, the role that they play locally in defining the community and providing um, the, the foundations for restored civil society and, and economic recovery. The destruction of cultural heritage in Palmyra and the beheading of those who kept them safe were aimed at the same thing. Murder and destruction of culture are inherently linked, Irena Bokova, then Director General of UNESCO, said in response to the attacks in Palmyra. This is a way to destroy identity. You deprive them, people of their culture, you deprive them of their history, their heritage, and that is what goes hand in hand with genocide, because you've taken anything th from them that, that bound them together as a people. You made them more vulnerable as a result. Along with the physical persecution they want to eliminate, to delete the memory of these different cultures is what ISIS threatens to do and did in many cases. Then UN De De Deputy Secretary General Jan uh, Eliasson put it this way. He said, the destruction of cultural heritage bears witness to a form of violent extremism that seeks to destroy the present, past, and future of human existence. In other words, it's all about the ending of human misery of civil war and jihadist violence. If the aggressive and oppositional forces of civil war are to be countered, a sense of a common humanity born out of an identification with the world's cultural heritage is necessary. 
whether it be with sites and monuments still standing where they were cut out of the earth or built out of wood and stone, like the temples in Palmyra and the Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo, or with sculptures and paintings, portable heritage, movable heritage that, can be, that have been taken from museums or have been destroyed in museums, as we saw in that early video. Portable heritage that now reside safely far from where they were first located as, as they now reside in the great museums in the world, whether that be in London on the left or Abu Dhabi on the right. Cultural heritage provides a sense of caring for and identification with a common humanity. How then has the international community responded to the destruction of cultural heritage in, for example, Syria, but also in Iraq? Mainly with expressions, expressions of outrage and condemnation, and then the passage of resolutions. Resolutions number one, that respect the, sovereign, in, the sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of the nation state and concern. Always putting that first, that's a condition of membership in the United Nations. Number two, condemning ISIS for destroying Iraqi and Syrian cultural heritage. Number three, prohibiting the use of funds to directly or indirectly benefit ISIS. Number four, hold all parties accountable to the relevant positions of international law. Number five, demand that all United Nations member states take appropriate steps to prevent trade in Iraqi and Syrian cultural heritage. Number six, call on UNESCO and Interpol to assist in this effort. And number seven, counter extremism and intolerance within the countries through education and the strengthening of civil society. So those you can look at, any resolution the UN puts forward in response to the tragedy that's, um, that's playing out still in Syria, but also from time to time in, everywhere from Iraq to Afghanistan, not to mention uh, those uh, uh, in Yemen and uh, um, in Western, in Mali and Western Africa. But, but there's a kind of standard response, a response again of outrage and passing resolutions codifying the outrage. For example, um, on December 3rd, 2014, UNESCO held an international conference on heritage and cultural diversity at risk in, era, in Iraq and Syria and called for the implementation of the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Heritage in the Event of Armed Conflict. That was mentioned also in the video. Hague 1954 obligates its state, nation state signatories. Not everybody signs on to Hague 1954, but those who did are then obligated by the terms of the contract they've signed. Uh, and it obligates its nation state signatories to, number one, prevent the exportation of cultural property from a territory occupied by them during an armed conflict. So prevent the, the removal of, uh, of cultural heritage. Number two, take into custody cultural property imported into its territory, either directly or indirectly from any occupied territory, taking it, holding it so that it can be returned. Number three, the return then of such cultural property at the close of hostilities to the competent authorities of the territory pre previously occupied. And four, pay an indemnity to the holders in good faith of any cultural property which has to be returned in accordance. So those are the kind of basic terms in 1954, reflecting on what the, the problems of World War II and the loss of cultural heritage in World War II, of how to respond to it. Of course, it only obligates those, as I said, who signed on to it. If they didn't sign on to it, they're not obligated. They can, they can pillage and destroy at will it, without, uh, by the terms of 1954 Hague Convention, without the the, um, the uh, response of those signatories. It is unclear how the convention's guidelines apply to the case in Syria, with so many non-state actors active in controlling substantial areas within its national borders. The same is true of the second protocol to the Hague Convention, something that followed it in 1999. It calls upon state parties or signatories to, these, to the Convention 54, um, uh, and neither, we should say, Syria, Russia, nor the US, let alone ISIS, has signed on to the protocol. No, but they require them to take measures for safeguarding cultural property in times of peace. It allows waivers on the basis of imperative military necessity, if you can determine what that means, what is the imperative military necessity, when no choice is possible between such use of the cultural property and another feasible method for obtaining a similar military advantage. If you have to, to, to gain your military advantage for perhaps very legitimate and, and appropriate purposes, and you must use the Great Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo is your basis, or you must attack it for a basis. You might be, uh, might be uh, permitted to do so under the terms of this, uh, these protocols. Um, it forbids any illicit export or other removal or transfer of ownership of cultural property, so the movable things that can be taken from museums, can be taken from libraries, and defines the terms for placing cultural heritage under enhanced protection. One, if it is a cultural heritage of the greatest importance to human humanity, 
Getting people to agree on what that is is difficult. It is protected by adequate domestic legal and administrative measures, recognizing its exceptional cultural and historic value and ensuring the highest level of protection. And it is not used for military purposes or to shield military sites. And a declaration has been made by the party that has control over the cultural property, confirming that it will not be so used. Getting people to agree to abide by these things is the difficult, difficult thing. To receive such enhanced protection and to make any protection of cultural heritage more, uh, only more unlikely to succeed, the party that has jurisdiction or control over the property must request such protection by submitting a list of cultural properties for which it intends to request the granting of enhanced protection. Can you imagine, in the midst of the great civil war in Syria right now, people pausing to sort of draw up a list, justify that list, submitting it to the, to the proper authorities of the United Nations? It just isn't going to happen in times of the chaos of civil war. There's no time for such uh, political maneuvering. There is also the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which in its preamble makes clear that all peoples are united by common bonds, their cultures pieced together in a shared heritage, and that it is the duty of every state to exercise its criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes. It also reaffirms the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, in particular that all states, and this is important for the end of my talk, all states shall refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of a state. The sovereignty of the state is paramount. That's a condition of membership of the United Nations. So intervening against the authority of the state is a grave act and trying to create um, understanding that there are times in which the sovereignty is, can, doesn't deserve the, the respect that it otherwise is given by allowing for intervention is the key here. And there's an argument that's called, uh, that's, been, that's used in Kofi Annan, who, when he was Secretary General of the United Nations, used it, which is the sovereignty is, is not, um, it is something that one earns. It's not something which one is born into. So the sovereignty of a state one, if one doesn't protect the citizens of a state, the, 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 the clients of the state, then one is not meeting up to one's responsibilities as a sovereign government. Uh, from, June, from June 17, 2004 to February 12, 2015, the U UN Security Council adopted numerous resolutions reaffirming the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Syria and Iraq and condemned ISIS and its destruction of cultural heritage. In one case in 2014, it reaffirmed the UN's strong commitment to the sovereignty, once again, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Syria and Iraq. UN Security Council 2170 of August 20, of one month later, emphasized its affirmation of the independence, sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity of Iraq, and strongly condemned the indiscriminate killing and deliberate targeting of civilians, persecution of individuals, and entire communities on the basis of, the, of their religion or belief, destruction of cultural and religious sites, and obstruction of exor uh, exercise, obstructing the exercise of economic, social, and cultural rights, including the right to education. These statements, which seem so easy to do, if you can get the, you know, the, the Security Council to agree to approve a resolution, that's a hugely difficult task because you've got permanent members of the, of the, of the um, Security Council, which includes the United States, Russia, and China, who don't agree on much of anything. But getting them to agree is one thing, and then, then getting people to act on according to that statement and that resolution is yet another thing. A year later, in 2015, uh, the UN General Assembly unanimously, and this is important, unanimously called for an immediate halt to the destruction of cultural heritage of, of Iraq, including religious sites or objects, and urged the preservation of cultural heritage of Iraq by protecting cultural and religious properties and sites consistent with humanitarian law. So it got out of the Security Council and was adopted by the entire UN General Assembly unanimously, almost never, never done. In this case, it was only with regard to Iraq. It also stressed that the religious properties uh, that perpetrators of such attacks against buildings dedicated to religion, education, art, science, or charitable purposes will be held accountable. There's no legal teeth to such a statement, but it begins to build up a set of, of um, principles that will, can take on uh, um, legal status as time goes on. They begin to underpin all the actions of military, political, and legal responses to such crimes as we've witnessed. Then on January 2017, the UN Security Council press statement noted the statement by then UNESCO De Director General Irina Bokova that this destruction is a new war crime. 
using a very loaded term, a new war crime, and an immense loss for the Syrian people and for humanity. Key to put both Syrian people and humanity in the same s sentence. And the and UN vo vo voiced their support for UNESCO and its efforts to assist in the implementation of relevant provisions of, U of United Security Council Resolution 2199. So what more than, after doing all of this, you know, having um, uh, agreements between nations, having resolutions passed by the Security Council, having resolutions passed by the General Assembly, what more can the international community do to protect cultural heritage than issuing statements of outrage and condemnation and drafting these, adopting a kind of precedent-setting resolutions like these? Because it still goes on. All this was done, much of it was done before Syria and Iraq, and then most, the rest of it was done during the chaos in Syria and Iraq. I recently proposed a five-point proposal for the protection of cultural heritage in conflict zones. It calls for the international community to, one, embrace and participate in a military blue helmet option to protect cultural heritage in the region, taking what we, the UN, allows, permits for the intervention in, in uh, dysfunctional, failing states that are committing acts of genocide, allowing that same kind of international response in to protect cultural heritage. Number two, to support the vigilant policing of the region's political borders to discourage the illicit export and import of cultural heritage artifacts and the loss to us of those things and damage through damage and the theft. Number three, to encourage safe harbor protection of heritage artifacts and circulation outside their likely modern country of origin to be turned, returned once stability in the region has been restored. So once they are taken out of Syria, they're not then just handed off to others. They're kept in safe zones so they can be returned to Syria once, re once stability has been re restored. Uh, to re restore partage to promote the scientific excavation of ancient sites, the sharing of the resulting fines with the global community and broadly distributing the risk to their physical integrity through accidental or, or intentional theft or destruction. And then finally, number five, to promote greater transnational cultural understanding of cultural identity. At the same time, I've discussed the protection of cultural heritage and conflict zones with numerous friends and colleagues. In one such conversation with Jonathan Fanson, president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, I expressed my frustration at the absence of any underlying framework for the protection of cultural heritage and conflict zones. Everything was done above a kind of framework and an ad hoc basis. I had come to believe that the numerous and well-intentioned responses of the UN Security Council and General Assembly, UNESCO and individual nation states, and numerous not-for-profit organizations, while calling attention to the problem and documenting its tragic effects, were doing little to prevent the destruction of cultural heritage. And so I asked Jonathan if he knew of such a framework, if there was such a framework that exists, which, while not compelling the international community to act in defense of cultural heritage, could permit it to take such dramatic action. And Jonathan said he did. That's why you talk to people. You know, they tell you things you didn't know. Uh, earlier, as president of the MacArthur Foundation, he had helped fund the research and development of what came to be the founding principles of this thing called responsibility to protect. I'll get to that in a second. An international legal norm for the protection of populations against genocide. And he suggested that the American Academy and Getty Trust might join forces and plan a meeting in London at the British Academy to discuss the applicability of such a framework for the protection of cultural heritage. It seemed perfectly reasonable. I agreed immediately, and we gathered together legal and policy experts, including Lloyd Axworthy, foreign, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, and an important participant in the development of responsibility to protect. Tom Weiss, already mentioned, uh, Professor of Political Science at CUNY Graduate Center, then and director of the team that developed the underlying textual resources of R2P, responsibility to protect. Yeah. And Ed Luck, professor of politics at Columbia University and former special advisor to the U to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon during the development of R2P to discuss the prospect of an R2P-like structure for the protection of cultural heritage. The results of the London meeting convinced us that we were on to something, so we, continued, we agreed to continue meeting to advance the proposition of a new international norm for the protection of cultural heritage. Over the next 20 months, we met three times in New York, once um, again in the military, with the military leadership of Canada, and working with the military leadership is extremely important because these people don't fool around. They, they know the, the, what, what's, what's, what it's like on the ground, what's at risk in the protection of cultural heritage, and why it might be to the advantage of uh, the, the, the populations at risk. 
because it, they, they will be the first to tell you there's no military solution to Syria. There's no military solution to, solution to Iraq. There's no military solution to Afghanistan. It's got to have to be some counterinsurgency campaign uh, and a building of trust in populations. And so it's good to have the military in, in the conversation. We also spoke with Gareth Evans, who was foreign, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Australia and a major force behind the adoption of R2P by the United Nations and with Simon Adams, who's the Executive Director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. And finally, we gathered lots of politicians and diplomats of the United Nations last September to talk further, last September, to talk further about this. In taking the leadership on the project, the Getty has initiated a series of occasional papers dedicated to the cultural heritage policy and recently published our first such paper called Cultural Cleansing and Mass Atrocities, Protecting Cultural Heritage in Armed Conflict Zones, written by Third time I've said his name, Ted we Tom Weiss. Two more papers are in the works, one to be written by Ed Luck, whom I mentioned, and the second by Hugh Aiken, whom I mentioned. Our intention is far from modest. It is to keep testing the waters on the subject until ultimately the, United Gen the UN General Assembly adopts a framework for the protection of cultural heritage on the scale of and remodeled on the responsibility to protect framework for the protection, protection of mass atrocities. I think there's nothing m more important right now than that, and I'll get to that. A PDF of this occasional paper it can be downloaded from the Getty's website, www.getty.edu. So, so very quickly, the R2P framework was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2005. It says that the duty to prevent and halt genocide and mass atrocities lies first and foremost with the state, but the international community has a role that cannot be blocked by the invocation of sovereignty. Sovereignty no longer exclusively protects states from foreign interference. It is a charge of responsibility where states are accountable for the welfare of the people. Sovereignty is something that you earn. It's not something that you're given. Their principle is enshrined in Article I of the Genocide Convention and embodied in the principles of sovereignty as responsibility and in the concept of the responsibility to protect. The R2P framework is based on three pillars of responsibilities. Very quickly, the first is the state carries the primary responsibility. These things are within the territorial integrity of the state, and effectively they are the cultural property of the state, not cultural heritage of mankind alone, but the cultural property of the state. Um, and they have responsibility to protect people, populations from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing, and their incitement. Number two, the international community has a responsibility to encourage and assist states in fulfilling this responsibility. So if the states have the first responsibility, if they can't do it, the international community has a responsibility to help them do it. If they are, and can't do it and unwilling to do it, then the international community has a responsibility to intervene in the protection of uh, civilian populations against threatened genocide. If a state is manifestly failing to protect its populations, the international community must be prepared to take collective action to protect populations in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. R2T, R2P has been criticized for infringing on national sovereignty, Advocates for R2P counter that the only time the international community will intervene in a state without its consent is when the state is no longer upholding its responsibilities as a sovereign to protect its citizens or subjects from mass atrocities. They've given up that authority that comes with sovereignty. Needless to say, R2P, like humanitarian intervention itself, is open to interpretation on its terms. But the simple fact that R2P has been adopted by the United Nations General Assembly, that is the entire General Assembly unanimously in 2005, means that there is consensus that sovereignty alone does not justify a state failing to meet its responsibility to protect its citizens or subjects. So the question is, can you get the very same agreement for the protection of cultural heritage? If states have the obligation to protect cultural heritage within their borders, and the United States really says that they do, what responsibility does the international community have when the state is unable or unwilling to exercise that obligation? The question derives from the language of the United Nations uh, that the language of the United States has used when describing cultural heritage as state property and when calling upon the state to fulfill its obligations to protect such property, not only for the sake of the state, but also for the sake of humankind in general. Very quickly, UN Secretary, then Secretary, uh, UN Director General, UNESCO Director General, Irina Bokova, has used this very same language. She said in, in January, uh, June 14th, 2015, she called upon this world to see ISIS's destruction of cultural heritage as cultural cleansing of a kind as deliberate attacks against civilians and ethnic and cultural minorities. She called it murder and destruction of culture are inherently linked. In June 2014, she called on all Iraqis to stand united for the protection of the country's cultural heritage, which she also described and declared to be a unique testimony of humanity 
of the origins of our civilization and of our inter-ethnic and inter-religious coexistence. It is also a key to resilience for building a better future. These, again, are statements that can be, become the basis for any kind of agreement. And then later in, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, she called the destruction of cultural heritage cultural cleansing, drawing parallel to ethnic cleansing cultural eradication and cultural looting. And she emphasized that protecting cultural heritage must be an integral part of all peace building. She stated that saving the past of Iraq and Syria is essential to saving our collective future, that to build peace tomorrow, we need to safeguard today there, Iraq's and Syria's heritage of diversity and tolerance to prepare the ground for reconciliation, and that the destruction of cultural heritage is a crime against humanity. Finally, in April 2015, she called on all Syrians to unite for the protection of their shared cultural heritage. This heritage belongs to all Sy Syrians and to all humanity. I call, she said, I call on all parties to refrain from using cultural heritage sites for military purposes and to protect them against any possible destruction resulting from fighting. None of this would have had have the collective force of responsibility to protect framework for the protection of cultural heritage. Uh, unless they were adopted by the United Nations. And that's why the Getty Trust is working to explore the applicability of an R2P for cultural heritage. As mentioned earlier, the Getty has initiated its publication series. The first one, as I said, is on cultural cleansing uh, and mass atrocities. It addresses the problems that I've raised and considers the example of R2P with regard to the adoption of a new international norm for the protection of cultural heritage in conflict zones. Let me conclude by naming just a few of these. First. Damage to cultural heritage in armed conflicts can be both intentional and collateral. You can destroy it because you want to destroy it or by accident it gets destroyed or damaged. When intentional, it is indicative of the intention to commit genocide or ethnic cleansing, which is, a, which is true of recent living cultural heritage, like the Umayyad Great Mosque of Aleppo, as it is of ancient sites and monuments, like the temples in Palmyra. The first is an attack on a living culture, one that threatens the attackers who consider it false or apostate. While the second is a form of cultural erasure of our, as our paper's authors put it, usually in the service of a competing historical narrative and as part of a strategic calculation, once again to justify and solidify the post-battle position of the victors. Second, there are costs and benefits associated with the destruction of cultural heritage that must be taken into account. In our author's words, first, the destruction of cultural heritage is ruinous for cultural identity and social cohesion. Second, especially in cases of high-profile sites, destruction can severely impair post-crisis economic recovery and can remove investment opportunities. The economics of post-conflict investment are often overlooked. And third, the loss of cultural artifacts and sites preclude any future study of them and possibly forecloses the resolu resolution of open archaeological, anthropological, and historical questions. One might compare those such losses to the, the dis disappearance of species and biodiversity. One needn't choose, and I'm serious about this, one needn't choose between culture and species of biodiversity, or even between cultural heritage and people. The fate of each, cultural heritage, people, and biodiversity, are intertwined and necessary for post-conflict revival. Like schools, hospitals, and places of worship, cultural heritage gives people something to come home to. Let me close with one last point. It is not only a matter of how we might restore the damage done to cultural property of Syria, it is, more importantly, also about how we can prevent such damage from happening in the, to the world's cultural heritage, wherever and under whose authority it may now reside. To date, most responses to attacks on cultural heritage have been simply condemn and to record them. There are numerous websites that post satellite images of cultural heritage sites at risk or under attack. These are of the greatest importance for recording what remains of historical sites and monuments and may be useful in re reconstructing sites and monuments post-conflict. But still, in all such cases, the damage to cultural heritage has already been done. What remains is to prevent the damage and destruction in the first place. And I think only intervention can do this. This is why the Getty is encouraging the adoption of a legal framework and international norm for the protection of cultural heritage, a responsibility to protect cultural heritage. If we, use, if we value cultural heritage for all the reasons I've suggested we do, we must accept the responsibility to protect them. And in so doing, we must work together to build a common regard for cultural heritage as not of one or another nation's cultural property to be used and misused for modern nationalistic purposes, but instead as belonging to all humanity and in which all of humanity has a collective stake in its preservation. In the words of uh, Director General Irena Bokova, 
we must respond to the destruction of cultural heritage by showing that ex exchange and dialogue between cultures is a driving force for all. We must respond by showing that diversity has always been and remains today a strength for all societies. We must respond by standing up against forces of fragmentation, by refusing, refusing to be divided into us and them. We must respond by claiming our cultural heritage as the commonwealth of all humanity. Only then, I think, will the ideals of UNESCO to contribute to peace and security by promoting collaboration among nations to further universal respect for justice, the rule of law, and human rights without distinction of race, sex, language, or religion, as put forward in the Charter of the United Nations, have any meaning in currency. And this isn't in great part what the people in Syria want, and isn't this in great part what the people in Syria want for themselves and for all others who, like them, are forced to return to burned out and broken fragments of cities, sites of civil wars and jihadist insurgencies targeted by the political regime that claims to represent them and by the claim of sovereignty has the responsibility to protect them. We live, live in dangerous times and the more we understand that we all have a stake in the preservation of the world's cultural heritage as our common heritage, that any and all forms of cultural expression produced at any time in any part of the world are all of ours to identify with and to be inspired by. By dint of our being humans, individuals capable of surmounting the limitations of our national affiliations, the better off we will be and the greater will be the prospects for a safer world. Thank you. Also have a microphone, so we're trying to record this for posterity for the future. Uh, so if you'll please raise your hand if you have a question, and uh, McMahon will daintily and gracefully move across the Absolutely. stage to deliver it to you. I can start. Okay, fair enough. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, so. One of the bases for this idea of equating humanity and cultural heritage kind of together is um, equating modern present humans with the humans of the past tied through this kind of conduit of the cultural heritage that is left, right? Is that an argument that's been made by philosophers or any other kind of group that tries to equate humanity not just a single time and frame but, but kind of vertically as well? Is the question, has it been said before? Yeah, I mean, has, has this equation of like, like humans now and humans in the past and equating now and the past and the future as a singularity rather than as discrete times of past, present, and future? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I think so. I mean, if, if only in our greatest religions, uh, if that, that were the case, we would identify over the course of time. We don't identify with just the time in which we live. So I think that, yeah, that has been, has been said before. What, what is, what is uh, missing, I think, is the connection of that kind of response to the claims against cultural heritage to the response that these are important for local uh, identification and communal development and post-conflict uh, recovery of uh, economics and vitality. It's, it's, it's not, un and I've made this, said it a number of times in the talk probably, so you forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but it's not unlike saying that it's important to protect schools and it's important to protect uh, religious buildings because of the communal life that is you know, in, in instigated by that kind of activity. Uh, so it, it, these things have a life to play, a role to play in the current circumstances of living, uh, not just as monuments to a past, now extinct life. Uh, this way in the back. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. So you mentioned uh, that the reconstruction of cultural heritage sites uh, is is important to the recovery of any uh, well of any culture. Oh, exactly. What does that look like, or uh, how how is that done? I realize this is a specific nuance, but I'm curious. Things like Palmyra can't be reconstructed, or or perhaps you mean they can. And so, what does that right. what does that look like? Yes. Yeah, so I try to argue that, um, that we should prevent these things from being destroyed rather than come back only afterwards to re reconstruct them. So absent the protection and facing the destruction, reconstruction, I think, is a, an appropriate response because it provides people, if nothing else, it provides them a sense of, of restoring something they value as a community of people, of people who recognize them and kind of identification one with another. But they also provide um, um, the, an economic um, opportunity for people, not only the execution of the, the reconstruction itself, it's like a major... Uh, 
uh, infrastructure project that, that produces jobs, that produces income, that produces uh, strength to the economy, uh, but also because it, um, it, it builds a, 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 um, uh, an opportunity for um, t tourist uh, visits and the economy that comes around a tourist economy. So I think these things have, uh, I said it before, but I'll try to say it again clearly. I think these things are not just, are not separate uh, activities. I don't think there is just a kind of an affiliation with an imagined past. I think there's also uh, an, an, a, um, an, an a contemporary uh, opportunity that these things provide for coherent building cohesive, restoring cohesive communal identity as well as economic vitality. So um, thank you very much for a, a fascinating talk. Um, my question is, um, there's a long Western imperial discourse of uh, intervening in local communities, oftentimes for protectionist ends. Um, uh, sometimes humanitarian in certain forms, uh, other times for antiquities. And, I guess I'm, the question I'm wondering is, um, how do you differentiate what you're calling for uh, from older sort of imperial forms of in intervention? Because it, it, um, um, you're making a powerful argument for uh, overriding local sovereignties uh, when sovereign entities are not uh, capable of protecting, and it, at least if I'm hearing you correctly. And that's true, exactly. Uh, exactly. And uh, so, um, you know, it, 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 how, it, how would you respond to, uh, 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 say, someone playing the devil's advocate who right, said, well, right. this just sounds like right. uh, the same argument that we've been hearing for uh, centuries vis-a-vis right. uh, -vis many of these same places? Yeah, I think that's a very important question and a fair critique. So what I'm not asking for is the um, uh, uh, removal of cultural heritage from that and that's that sovereign entity, but ra except except for in um, safe har safe haven zones, so they can be returned to that entity rather than leaving them at risk in that entity. But more important, what I'm trying I'm trying to do is trying to answer the question that local people have who are trying to s take hold of their lives in destroyed Raqqa, damaged Aleppo, and damaged Palmyra, damaged Damascus. Is where were you when we asked for your help? You know, what are we doing? Uh, we're, we're, we're playing a, a geopolitical game to our advantage. That sounds like imperialism to me, in a way, because it's about what's, what's, it, what's in it for us. Well, what's in it for us is what's good for the world. And, and clearly, failed states and, and civil wars are, as this colleague wrote, um, you know, the source of the greatest human tragedy in the world. So where are we? Are we leaving it up? Are we playing with the Russians? Are we playing with the Turks? Are we playing with uh, the, the, the Iranians? You know, what, what is it? What are we in there for? Well, you know, are we in there just to do damage and destroy? Or are we there to protect and help? So the war is going to be over at some time, and then people are going to say, "What did you do?" And um, we can't be so, so. You know, we we can't just be. We had we had a chance, and I you know I think Mr. Obama missed a great opportunity to go in when we, didn't, we had confirmed that there was nerve gas being used against the citizens. And we didn't do that. So we showed the citizens that we didn't care enough. We cared more about ourselves than them. <coughs> yes, uh, thank you. This is... Uh, After you, we have another talk. Okay. This is uh, very fascinating. Um, I have uh, two questions. The first one has to do with um, why it uh, has taken so long for the international community to come to some kind of consensus about uh, how to respond and react to this uh, kind of um, destructions that uh, we've witnessed in the last few years, especially in the light of what took place during the uh, second Iraqi war the, um, under uh, President Bush, right. when a lot of um, museum artifacts uh, were looted or stolen or taken away from um, Iraq and some of these ancient things that disappeared into different places around the world. And people were shocked by it. There was a huge reaction about why the government or the military didn't do anything to protect these artifacts. Uh, 
uh, there was a genuine concern uh, for it. And then ISIS came a couple of years later. I think the Taliban also were engaged in the early years of the war in some major destructions of some ancient monuments uh, before the current uh, era. So, or the, the last few years. So, but it's taking a long, it's taking a long time, or even to now, I'm not even sure whether there's any concrete agreement, agreement about how to preempt this, how to stop this um, in, uh, in the future. The second question as is more general, and you don't have to address that one. Uh, this is related to what Lai has just asked. Um, over the years, people have uh, taken artifacts, uh, or a lot of museum pieces, um, antiquity objects, from different places around the world by force, or by stealing them, or by uh, conquering these places. And you have a number of cases in which some of these materials have been returned voluntarily because those countries requested for them. Um, and there's a lot of debate today about whether some of these stolen artifacts or uh, seized or forced, falsely acquired art artifacts should be returned back to those countries. Uh, I, I have sympathy for your argument that in places where people can no longer actually keep or preserve or sustain these artifacts, uh, you don't send them back until you can be sure they won't disappear again. Um, uh, you have to make sure the environment makes it possible. But do, I don't know whether they are connected, yes. Yeah, I think, I think lack of trust is a huge factor that plays into this. Um, and self-interest is another factor that plays into this. So we have to build trust and assure a joint interest, common interest in, in these things. And the only way we can do it is by being engaged and, and will, being willing to sacrifice in the process and, uh, and, to sh and to show that we care for these people and their lives and their futures, not just their past. Um, so I think it's, it's, but you know, not, not engaging, you know, and, and, and I tried to separate out and concentrate this time almost exclusively on built heritage, because we have ways of dealing with portable heritage, not, not, not you know, successfully, but we have ways of doing it. The easiest way and the most dangerous way is stopping the border, preventing things from getting out, but keeping them in harm's way. To me, it makes no sense. But I understand that there's lack of trust. I understand that uh, post-colonial and post-imperial time, that people are asking questions that uh, need to be answered. But in the midst of it all, what's the choice? Uh, and, 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 and there's, there, I'll say one just last thing. There's been an exaggeration. Getting accurate information is extremely difficult. We know there's an exaggeration of, energy, of, of the um, claims made shortly after the rise of ISIS, when it was said that ISIS neck was, was you know, engaging in, bla in black market uh, e economy of cultural artifacts, and that second only to oil was it providing the kind of resources that, uh, that uh, ISIS needed to, to do, it, do its work. Um, there's just no justification for that. There's, there's, and then the University of Chicago has done a study at the schools of Oriental, uh, that, um, or the Oriental, Oriental Institute that documented that there was just no possibility that to be. That's not to say that there wasn't damage and destruction and theft and, and uh, black market trading, but we can't just leap to some kind of exaggerated sense that this is a terrific um, scale. We've got to be accurate about it, but we've got to build trust with people, and, and these people want help. I mean, you can't tell me that, that you have a choice of living in rock under those conditions or having people come in and help you. It just doesn't defies reason. So the more that you, they show that you're there to help them, the more trust you'll have. And, uh, and right now, we're, we've, got no, we've got little trust among those people because we're not, not doing our humanitarian responsibility, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a wildlife conservation major, and so the thing about biodiversity at the end there really intrigued me, and I was curious <clears throat> if these cultural heritage sites that you're referencing are specifically things that are man-made, or can you include things like delicate arches or some of the national uh, monuments or national parks that we have here in the States or around the world, and is protecting those just as important in, in the sense of uh, yeah. what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to that because I just don't, I'm not that experienced or, or knowledgeable. But uh, 
so I, see, I, I limit my remarks to cultural heritage as opposed to natural, na natural heritage. But the same argument could equally be made. So the, you, you can't say that it was good for the natural environment when those great repositories of oil were set afire and filled the air with this smoke that rose up that poisoned the, the earth and poisoned the water that was around it. So more can't be good for the biodiversity of the planet. It'll, ex it'll extingu extinguish some aspects of the national biodiversity, I'm sure. It can't be good for the economic diversity and stability of the, of the, of the planet. It can't be true good for the cultural diversity of the planet either. So I think these things are interrelated, but, but um, I could only speak with some little authority about the cultural uh, diversity of the planet. But I think you're absolutely right. So I know that your focus wasn't on technology, but do you think that technology could play an important role in either educating people that may live in different areas on what's going on and getting them to care, or even help prevent destruction of these um, sites or help restore them? Uh, I think the answer is yes in uh, almost every respect, which is to say that, that uh, as I said in, in my paper, um, the digitization of sites, and the, we developed something at the Getty that's called Ar Arches, which is a satellite-based geospatial monitoring system of cultural heritage, and it's uh, uh, open sourced and it's available online for free, so people can make of it. Good people can make of it, and bad people can make of it what they want out of it. But nevertheless, it can be done. So it's a matter of mapping it and, and measuring the, the threats to these sites, documenting, monitoring those threats, not preventing the damage but just taking photographs, documenting things so that should something happen to them, we've got the basis of what it was prior to the destruction and maybe something can help for the, res the reconstruction. However, it's never the same recon to reconstruct. And that's certainly not to rely on this and say, okay, let it be destroyed, we can always build it when peace is restored. So I think technology is helpful, it's limited like everything, but I don't think we should be satisfied with just allowing things to be destroyed because we're confident we can rebuild them with 3D printing. I think we have time for two more questions. The first one's here. There you are. Thank you. Um, so you spoke about this as if it's a really recent issue, and you spoke a lot about Syria. Has it ever come up maybe before and just nothing's been addressed about, it? like, for example, during the Israel conflict? Because I know that's been going on for a while, and probably a lot of the similar issues are being... Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's been codified since the Second World War, as I said, in the 1954 Hague Convention. But it certainly rose to the uh, awareness of our modern folks, you know, during the Napole Napoleonic Wars, where there was a lot of looting and, and then re restoration of things looted once Napoleon lost uh, in 1814 or 15. Um, but it certainly has been the case of all. I mean, it's, it's how you overcome the resistance of people, it's destroy their homelands. And uh, so, so it's been around for a very long time. And I think what, what we are facing with today is probably the, uh, the ease with which it can be done, because we can fly drones in and destroy things, which puts us l at less risk and them at greatest da danger. So, so I think it's easier and it's more visible to us. We see it more because we see it on television. We see it in the newspaper. We see it in, on radio or hear it on radio. Um, so I just think that this has been going on for a long time. It's been documented since the Second World War, and uh, we just care about it. I think we should, anyway. No, sorry. Okay, I'll do it. Maybe we'll make one more. I was wondering, um, you made a, a wonderful point about the issue of sovereignty um, and the degradation of sovereignty and the question of, of what point um, does it become a matter of that sovereignty having been uh, or no longer being fulfilled. So I guess one of my questions would be um, what happens when you have a, a sovereignty that's in power, in force, let's say a dictatorship? Um, or you have a, um, a situation where there is uh, generally a, a, an apparently strong force that is still failing uh, to either protect such works or uh, for, for whom the protection of these works, it, it's not in their interest. 
um, if you have political frac factions within a, a, what you might still consider a sovereign state. I'm not sure if that was yeah. too confused a question. Um, well, um, can anything then be done? Yeah, so you have to have a, have a set of measurements, as one has with R2P, that allows, justifies the intervention uh, in opposition to state sovereignty. And that had to do with mass atrocities, that had to do with genocide and various things. So you have to have some lines of measurement to, to have credibility that you're not just exercising, you're not, you're not um, state building, you're not going in and recasting a state in your own likeness so as to impose your view of the world on the world. So you have to some standards of things. And I don't exactly know what those standards are, but you've got to have them. I know that they are. And we know it when we see it. You know, you can, when you see the destruction of Raqqa, for example, that just ain't good. You know that's not right. It's not how people should live their lives. It's not how the, how the world should not respond but in, in situations like that. I think the world should respond in situations like that. So you've got to, have, you've got to come up with some kind of measure for, for how that justifies that kind of response. But clearly, in, you know, when, when people are not protected in, 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 at, at a scale that you would associate genocide or mass atrocities with, and when, when they're, ex, they're human, hu, humanly cleansed of the situation, they're taken out, uh, there's an equivalent to the cultural thing because when they come back, the few that remain that survive to come back, they have to come, as I said, come back to something. And you want to rebuild afterwards on the basis of something. But if that something isn't there, and over the course of time you did nothing, you both deprive them of their protection and you deprive them of the rebuilding. So what, what's left for them? Um, so that's what I think. Well, thank all of you for coming out. Please, as you leave, take part in our wonderful repast of brownies, cookies, coffee, et cetera. And please join me in thanking Dr. James Kuno for an enlightening lecture. Thank you.